Good morning, Proponomics people, and welcome to the supplement summarised. This is the supplement from the 2nd of June 2024, which I called the damp squib in, an ele in a reference I couldn't resist to the election and Rishi getting drenched outside. But also there's a number of things at the moment that are a, a bit damp squib style, uh, including the election campaigns themselves, some might say. Although you could argue it's hotted up a bit since Nigel Farage has joined the race and you wonder just how planned and orchestrated all that has been. Could be really clever, could be his first time after seven or eight or nine, or I've lost how many attempts to actually become a Member of Parliament. Of course, he was a Member of the European Parliament for a long time, so he hasn't lost every single election he's ever gone into. But in terms of actually becoming an MP, let's see what happens. Uh, I haven't looked at the betting markets for that one as yet. Anyway, the point of this video is I use uh, Google's Gemini in order to come up with an AI summary of the supplement for those who don't have the time or inclination to listen to the whole video. And then I rattle off uh, those, those summarised sections and I'm sometimes interested in what Gemini says I said, which is not what I said, or at least not what I meant to say anyway. So as we all know, the AI tools aren't perfect just yet, but here goes the summary. So as I said, damp squib because of that, that image that won't leave the, the minds and the memories for a long time of Rishi outside Downing Street getting soaked, not with his own umbrella, with no one to hold his umbrella for him. Um, didn't seem like a great time to come out and say no one else has got a plan when he couldn't even keep the weather off his back. But the funniest thing I saw, I think, was the things can only get wetter. That did that did make me laugh. Um, but as I say, the current property market, we were just getting into a nice run. Um, you know, it was a good time of year normally for sales and all the rest of it. And things are just bound to calm down now before the election. Um, certainly people will potentially wait and see what happens. Although there's very little point in doing that because stuff takes so long to do. Even leasehold reform, which was caught in the parliamentary wash up, that period uh, where they've called an election, but they haven't actually closed parliament yet. They managed to get the leasehold reform bill through, but it looks like it's going to be about a year before we get anything really meaningful about some of the important bits, such as you don't need to own a property for two years anymore to extend the lease. That's going to change a few opportunities in the way that shorter leases work and things like that. So it should be quite interesting. <clears throat> so anyway, market update. I always start with a bit of a market update and then get into the macro and then get into a deeper dive. So sales agreed per square foot. This is critical data that Chris Watkins shares on a weekly basis. Um, also publishes it on Property Industry Eye and on his LinkedIn. Very grateful for Chris for doing this. It's a, a very good service that he provides to the, the broader property market and Chris's Speciality is uh, working with estate agents and letting agents, but nonetheless, the data is key. And like me, he is a self-confessed data geek. The few conversations that we've shared have generally been around data and uh, what, what that means and what's going on and correlations and things that would send most people to sleep. So uh, Chris produces the uh, sales agreed prices per square foot, which is useful. You know, and we've moved in a market now where we're about £330 a foot back in January on sales agreed to near £350 a foot in May. So there's a 5.1% increase there in sales agreed when we look at sales per square foot. Now we know smaller properties are selling better and people are downsizing and compromising on downsizing because the interest rate is higher just so they can afford to get on the ladder. Um, they're rather compromised on space it seems than compromise on location. Sometimes they're having to compromise on both. But also just think broader and think more psychologically People have waited. In 2020, 2021, we brought forward loads of transactions with the stamp duty holiday. And then we had a catch up period. And then we had a Liz Trust period. And then we had a period after that where everyone was kind of waiting. Everyone was so bearish in the media, or 90% of people were anyway, saying prices were going to crash. And it's very difficult as a first time buyer, I'd imagine, to sit there and wait and listen to all of that. And then think, well, I'm still going to buy my house, even though everyone's convinced prices are going down. And you know what? In 2023, they, they did go down. If we trust the ONS, 2.2%. I think they're the best source of truth because they have got all the transaction data. Uh, the Halifax maintained prices went up 1.7%. But I don't think that was correct from anything that I saw. But maybe perhaps bias more towards the north. Um, although obviously the Halifax are, are, are very much a, around the country lender these days. I was going to say nationwide, but that would confuse things even further as nationwide are the only others who produce an index. But 5.1% ahead for the year. I think this will start reflecting itself in sort of December's sort of figures. And that's the sort of number we're going to see as a print for 2024 um, and the forecasters will be largely speaking proven very wrong lots of them at the start of the year said we'd have a negative year for property goodness knows what happens when they think we're going to have a positive year we're going to have an absolute crack up boom i'd imagine but let's see but still lots and lots of listings so more listings than there's been over the past eight years 
in terms of this point in the year, in the cycle. So like people have waited to buy, people have also waited to sell. So there's tons and tons of stuff on the market. If you're selling at the moment, you need to do things that make you stand out. That's the, the bottom line of all of that. But net sales, so that is gross sales agreed minus any fall throughs, are still higher than the pre-pandemic market, still over 5% ahead of those years, 2017, 18 and 19, which we can use as a loose benchmark or a bit of a bellwether for more, more normal or less volatile times, which is what we seem to be transitioning into slowly after the impact of the COVID crisis and the response and the stimulus all sort of washes through the system. Um, so then to get into the macro, we've had some mixed economic data of late, really. Um, there's obviously this theory that soon that's called the election because this is as good as it's going to get, or we're certainly near the crest, or we've had these positive prints, inflation down near 2%. Um, does the general public care about how close or not that is? It sounds a lot better than 10%, and people will be feeling it in the pocket. And regardless of whether you're a benefits claimant or a pensioner, or a worker, what you will be feeling after April 2024 is better than you did before April 2024. Why? One, because of the price cap on energy coming downwards, and two, minimum wage increases, wage increases, you should be getting a bit better off. Who are the exception to that rule? People who either, A, have just had a big rent rise because their landlord is either, number one, profiteering, or number two, having to deal with a massively increased cost of debt, which is going to impact rentals much more than it does owner occupiers. Why is that? Because ultimately in rentals, landlords are largely using interest only mortgages, whereas in owner occupier, they're using capital repayment mortgages. So the capital amount people are paying back doesn't go up. In fact, it goes down if they lengthen the term, which is one of the ways that the lenders are telling you to deal with what's going on, right? So that's one, one part of the equation. But so that means instead of maybe the interest component being maybe a, nearly 100% more expensive, and that's pretty much where it is in buy to let compared to the very, very low false figures really in 2021, but that's roughly where we are. So compared to that point, we're talking 100% more expensive, whereas with, with interest only, that's 100%. With capital repayment, it might be only 50% increase, but it's still a 50% increase. And that's happening to 100,000 owner occupiers every month, which is clipping their wings quite a lot, of course. And goodness knows how many tenants are feeling a similar pinch. Although generally speaking, we're seeing rent rises in the sort of 9% category, according to the ONS, who've got the best data. But still, the cost of shelter is still moving upwards and it's lagging the inflation in everything else. So that is the, the, the one thing that won't be making for people feel better. But if you've already adjusted to your new mortgage or your new rent, or you're lucky enough to still be on a fix for another couple of years, that's not hitting the majority of those households, which is, you know, in the high 90s percent of households for owner occupiers anyway uh surprising print for distributive trades a positive increase it printed a plus eight um but having said that that was seen as the the rebound from a disappointing april which again was quite wet which puts retail punters off 37 percent of non-food stuff is now online uh, but of course that still means 63 percent is still boots on the ground and that's non-food food is is less online of course and more more uh face-to-face -face stuff shopping um, nationwide released their house price index plus 0.4 for the month um, plus 1.3 for the year so far not as in for 2024 but as in for the last 12 months so moving upwards it hasn't done a lot in the last 18 months is the reality and I think that would be a fair distinction of the market of course the thing that you shouldn't miss is that inflation's done all the heavy lifting making things more affordable wage inflation uh, primarily because people are getting paid more than they were 18 months ago aside from anything else. And then the Zoopla price index, they show a tiny uh, decrease compared to the previous year, minus 0.1%, but they do a very good job of highlighting regional variations, and they do um, 20, 20 cities, winners and losers, all the way from Belfast, that's doing very, very well at the moment, nearly up 4%, all the way down to Ipswich, which is this month's lucky loser, at minus 3%, which I struggled to justify, um, but there you go, perhaps... Uh, Someone else could comment about why they think that might be. It could just be a bit of statistical noise, of course, anyway. Then it was the end of the month, so the Bank of England released money and credit report. A slight decrease in remortgages, down from about 33k to about 29k, but they only measure remortgages where people move lender, so we don't really know about full product transfers and all the rest of it. Um, but 61,100 new mortgages, that was 200 shorter than the month of March, which was the previous month they'd reported on. 
No real biggie, to be honest. Massive increases, record amount of money put into ISAs. But of course, as I've said many times, when you've got lots of inflation, you have lots of records broken apart from anything else. And ISAs is no different. But also what we're seeing, and this is, touches on this phenomenon, which is no, no one had really been thinking was going to happen, is that pre-pandemic, we were saving maybe 5%, sometimes 4% of household income as a rule, as a nation. And we're now back up in the sort of 11% region at the moment, nearly treble what we were saving before. So cost of living, sure thing, but people are cutting back on consumption. Why would they be doing that? Well, there could be a number of reasons. One, savings become more attractive again. Two, they're still scared, scarred, PTSD, whatever from COVID, and they know they want to build savings up significantly. Three, they're nervous about a change of government and what that might bring would seem sensible to build a bit of a war chest in those situations. Uh, four, they over-consumed during COVID. All they could do is consume goods. And we've seen companies like Zoom and Peloton that did incredibly well. Everybody knows about the hot tubs and all the rest of that sort of stuff. That's all died off. So big ticket purchases, people still aren't confident enough for big ticket purchases. And I think they also might be thinking there might be some, some price cuts and some competition come back to the market because largely speaking, this inflation has been absorbed by the consumer so far and that might well not continue. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And then uh, I've already talked about the impact of rising interest rates on mortgage costs. I look at the uh, the base figure in terms of what the population is actually paying on average on owner occupier mortgages in this report, which is around about three and a half percent at the moment. And then the draw figure. So that's the mortgages drawn in the month of April 2024. What percentage did they go out the door at? And the answer is 4.74 percent. So this, as you would expect, we're still drawing at a higher rate than on average that we're paying as a nation. And the bigger gap between those two, the more consumption needs to be squeezed because ultimately people are going to need to spend more money as they drop off those rates. But what we should be seeing is that gap is obviously narrowing as it's been narrowing over the past 18 months. And also that 4.74 might well start to come down over the next six months as the trailing figure continues to increase. And we might end up the year at drawing at say 4.5, something like that. And we might end up uh, with the average figure being maybe 3.75 that everybody's paying and then that gap starts to narrow significantly and the trend should be for the UK interest rate downwards slowly that's the the current thinking and I think that is the case unless a black swan comes along or something significantly changes um, there is something I'm going to be talking about more and more over coming weeks and months and that is about the decoupling of the Federal Reserve the ECB and the Bank of England. And why is this going to happen? I just want to spend a couple of minutes on this now. I didn't discuss this in detail in the supplement, but I will go into it in more detail in future weeks. So ultimately, what you've got is, we've always had three independent nations, but when they've been facing global macro issues like COVID, impacted everyone in a, in a similar way. Uh, it depends on whether you export and import stuff. It depends what percentage of your income as a country comes from tourism for example, would have made a massive difference to certain countries. But generally speaking, there was a, a fairly similar response. A lot of the policy response in the UK was prompted by policy responses in Europe and the Western world in general. And you could say the same for the US. They all influenced each other, basically. Now, the Federal Reserve and, and America in general has not, in my opinion, had enough inflation to deal with the amount of extra money that was pumped in, in terms of stimulus. There's been massive house price inflation, over 20% up in real terms, US housing over the past four years, a pretty frightening figure. Now wages have gone up above inflation by about five or 6%, but you can see it starts to cause an affordability issue. And we know from watching those sort of long sweeping curves of the UK, that it is affordability that causes a problem but you also have to drill down a number of levels to get into the, the real data there when you're when you're talking about things like that. But there's always been this phrase, I've never liked it really, follow the Fed. Um, I've always believed that the banks are more independent than that on a central banking basis, but they're all really following a cycle. So they do end up following the Fed. And the Fed's just more aggressive because the, the American culture is just to be more front foot. The, look at what they did in the last hiking cycle. They hiked faster. Ultimately, actually, the Bank of England were the first ones to hike rates, December 2021. But the Fed soon caught up and overtook in that cycle. And they were going up three quarters of a percent. No problem. We were much more gradual, quarter percents, half a percent when we needed to. As a general rule, we were much more British about it. Ultimately, very typical for the Bank of England. So that's where we got to. And you could accuse one of following the other or whatever. Basically, they were dealing with the same sort of economic consequences. 
My contention here is they're not going to be dealing with the same economic consequences, right? Because inflation in the US is still going to be much, much more stubborn a fire to put out. It was down to 3% in June 2023, right? So we're 12 months on from there now, and it hasn't been down to 3% again since then. That's the stubbornness they're dealing with. We've already printed 2.3. That's to do with the energy side of things primarily, but energy only forms about 5% of CPI. So even with these dramatic drops, it's not the only fruit. And you have to still look at core inflation, which in both nations is too high still, to be honest. Um, but we've had a few prints you might be able to explain away. And you've got sticky wages. So at the moment, historically, you'd be talking about things like wage price spirals and you'd be worried about them. But wages are still catching up to everything else that's already gone up. And you have to remember this concept. Just because inflation has come down in number, things are still going up in price by 2.3% a year if that basket of goods that the ONS uses represents your consumption, which of course it doesn't because it's an average and that doesn't represent anybody's consumption in the real world. But my point is it's still going upwards. So while you've got wages well above inflation, which is a great place for it to be in the economy if it's sustainable, You've got prices going up in terms of services and business to business, but ultimately you have got a bit of margin squeeze as cost base goes upwards because not all consumers will swallow these price increases. And consumption is down, you know, eight, nine percent since the start of the pandemic. That's massive for GDP um, and how it's managed to grow in real terms is actually really impressive and or can be explained a lot by the massive increase in government spending since the pandemic, but this is the, the nuances of GDP that few people get into. But the, the moral of the story is the ECB, the Eurozone itself, the UK and the US are facing three quite distinctly different situations. Eurozone inflation looks the calmest, you'd expect it to. They still face comparatively high unemployment compared to the other two in the sort of 6% mark and their rates never got as high, 4%, right? But still record high for the European Central Bank in its relatively short history, but it needs to come down. And it's pretty much announced it's cutting rates this week. That's going to happen. The UK, now the conventional wisdom that seems to be prevailing is that they actually can't put uh, the interest rate down in the UK too quickly because it's going to look political. So the next meeting that we've got, which is the 20th of June, I believe the Thursday, in a couple of weeks' time, um, it's now very difficult for the bank to cut rates because it looks like they've got political um, and you would still think, my, 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 I was very much on the side of, we've missed, still missed consensus to the upside, one more meeting before we cut. Although I could easily be convinced now that today could be the time to cut, ultimately, because we've got longer term forecast showing inflation below target, and that's not what we want. And you have to forecast forward. So I would probably cross the floor at this point. I definitely would have voted to hold rates last time at the meeting. Uh, I'm, I'm up for cutting rates this time around, definitely. And that's not a self-interested play. Um, that I think is a, a wise play. But the decoupling, so what happens at the moment is when something happens in the US, the, the UK bond markets are seriously impacted by that. US looks like it's keeping rates higher for longer. UK must keep rates higher for longer. And my argument is that's never really been the case anyway. Um, there just has been correlation, but there isn't necessarily causation. And at some point, the markets are going to realise the UK is going to do its own thing and break away from the US. And I think that will see the yields in the UK clip back a little bit. How long is that going to take? Well, how long before the Fed puts off its first cut? And will the Fed get political? Because obviously, there's much, much, much more in terms of politics at play in the US. It's much more partisan. Um, you can see just from the amount the system's thrown at Donald Trump in terms of the court cases and all the rest of it. It's impossible to believe that none of that is politically motivated at all, um, even if it politically isn't a very smart thing to do and hasn't done the right thing for, for, uh, for Biden's campaign. But there we go. So they will decouple. I think yields in the UK can fall a bit. I think we're too high at the moment. I think in the US they can stay high until the Fed is very, very worried that the US just can't take on any more debt because ultimately they're feeding this massive beast and then deficit is just mind-blowing and they're spending far too much on servicing that debt apart from anything else. As I say, they've also got this house price, you know, bubbly looking situation, which how will it work itself out? Because you compare residential to commercial real estate prices, there's a big difference. And whilst we're drawing mortgage rates at 7.4, uh, sorry, at 4.74, uh, as I said, in the, in the, it's more like 7.4 in the US, it's around the 7% mark for these 30 year loans that they tend to take out, which is hurtful. But they were 
uh, more of a sort of there was a 3% time when things were very cheap, but they were more historically at the sort of 5% level. So 7 isn't terrible, but it's ultimately 40% more expensive than 5% is. So it's a huge, huge difference. And although there have been some good wage increases, the US faces some different problems to what the UK is doing. So drifted off a bit in terms of the summary of the supplement there onto some of the stuff I'm going to be talking about in the next few weeks. But hopefully if you've watched the supplement video, it makes it worth watching this one as well. Um, so have a have a look at that. Um, keep watching the channel. Um, you've also got to look at the Bank of England's view on inflation going forward. Uh, I think it's probably going to have a limited effect on house prices. That's what the bank thinks. Um, I think that that's probably right. I think we've we've seen the rockiest parts now. I think we'll continue to get disappointments, and this inflation will be stubborn-ish. But I don't think anybody really cares with inflation around about three percent. In fact, I think that it would be a reasonable target these days rather than 2%. So as long as the system holds up and is still predicting inflation to be quashed in three years' time, uh, people are going to stop caring about it. We're going to start talking about it less and less, but it is going to still work its magic on that nominal debt against any property assets that we own. So that's great news overall as investors. Calm inflation at 3% or even 3.5% is actually, I think, great news for property as a rule when you're using nominal debt. So bear that in mind. Um, Positive signs in the property market, just as a bit of a wrap up, um, in spite of the election being called, it looks like the election is not going to have a lot of impact on this market. Um, mixed thoughts on economic data, some good, some bad, but that's ultimately usually the way it goes. It rarely points in the in the right uh, in the right direction. But I think you know the overall thoughts are the market's at least going to stabilise at this level, if not continue to grow going forward, and there could be a bit of a post election boom if there is a bit of a feel good factor the country might feel good if Labour do win the country's got rid of the Tories I think 70 75 percent of people maybe more at the moment on the street would probably agree with that although they'll be concerned about Labour Party's increased spending and I do say a bit about increased spending on things like the NHS um, Labour grew their real term spending five and a half percent per year on average in the past parliament the Tony Blair years and Gordon Brown years, 97 to 2010. We can't grow at 5.5% above uh, inflation. It's just not feasible, possible. It wasn't feasible and possible then. Great outcomes in the NHS, sure thing, but ultimately not sustainable and the system will break unless we start charging for more stuff. This is my party political broadcast on why I'd never get elected, apart from anything else. Um, but that's where we are with it. The same goes for pensions. Two massive, massive crosses to bear. Two big hills to climb. Let's see what happens. Um, and that's where we are for a summary of this week's supplement and also what I'm going to be talking about going forward over the next one to two months. So I hope you enjoyed that. And please leave me a comment, like or a share on the video. Cheers.